Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Olivia Gross. I'm a first year student from New York City in the college, intending to study public policy. And I'm also a fellows ambassador this quarter here at the IOP. This program is produced in partnership with the Washington DC based think tank, the American Enterprise Institute. Today's topic of discussion is surrounding one of the most crucial issues in politics today, partisanship and polarization. Today, we will explore how we have become so polarized and how we can begin to bridge our divides. With us today are three individuals that it is a true honor to be introducing. First off, I am thrilled to welcome Senator Heidi Heidkamp, former Democratic Senator from North Dakota and co-founder of the One Country Project. Senator Heidkamp was elected in 2013 as the first female U.S. Senator from North Dakota. And during her six years in Congress, she focused on working across the aisle to deliver solutions to the people of her state. And I have the honor of serving as her fellows ambassador this quarter. Senator Hyde's camp seminars are on Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m., so make sure to check those out. Next, I'm very excited to welcome Congressman Will Hurd, former cybersecurity executive, undercover officer in the CIA, and Republican congressman from the state of Texas. With years of experience in undercover operations and cybersecurity, Congressman Hurd worked in Congress with a focus on good policy for the American people, having been described as the future of the GOP. Congressman Heard seminars are on Tuesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. Those are also great. We are currently at a crucial moment in our nation's history. Given the events which unfolded several weeks ago at the Capitol, and with the beginning of a new administration in Washington, there is much to discuss. Finally, the man we all know, David Axelrod, the director of the Institute of Politics, host of the Axe Files podcast, and former chief strategist and senior advisor to President Barack Obama. He will be moderating today's discussion with our panel of guests. So now, please join me in welcoming Senator Heidi Heidkamp, Congressman Will Hurd, and David Axelrod. Thank you so much, Olivia, and thanks to AEI for joining us in this program. And thanks to, uh, to uh, Heidi and Will, who have been uh, sensational presences as fellows uh, with us this quarter, and we're so happy uh, for that. You know, the uh, title of this uh, of this particular session is Healing Our Republic. And um, it strikes me that you two uh, are noteworthy, your, your admirable aberrations for all the efforts you've made to reach across the aisle uh, to, uh, to, to turn down the, 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 the level of, of acrimony in our politics and so on. But I have to note that you're sitting with us and not in Washington, DC right now. <laughs> and in some ways that may be a commentary on the challenge that we uh, that we face. So I want to give you just a few minutes to talk about where you think we are and what the hope is uh, for turning down that level of acrimony and, 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 and in fact, healing our republic. And, and Senator, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I would absolutely love to tell you that we are on the brink of a renaissance or a new age of um, political discourse and dialogue. Um, I think it is as yet to be proven, but right now I'm more pessimistic than um, optimistic about whether that's going to happen, in part because of what happened yesterday in the United States House of Representatives, uh, where 60 votes to sanction someone who voted her conscience um, beat uh, 10, only 10 votes to sanction someone who spews conspiracy theories and literally is poisoning the GOP. And so it tells you kind of where we are um, today in terms of trying to bring these two sides together. And, and, and probably against the backdrop of what we would think would be a uniting um, uh, crisis, which is the pandemic, um, we still can't pull it together. We still can't find that common ground. Um, we had a brief moment on the CARES Act and a couple of the packages um, that we're in against the backdrop of, a, of an election. But now that the election is no longer imminent, um, you see some of that willingness to cooperate waning. And, and so I think, I think that it's really going to depend on probably about 30 people in Congress in both the House and the Senate to decide whether we're going to set a different tone. Um, uh, it is, it, there's a willingness on the part of the president to do it. Um, but an unwillingness on the part of the president to delay doing what he thinks needs to be done for the country. So um, not very optimistic, David, in part because I think the GOP is still the party of Trump. Maybe I should have started off with Will. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for bringing a lot to on, ID on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> there's, a know, lot, um, there's a lot to unpack there that I want to unpack, but I want to, Will, I want to give you your, your, your opening, uh, your opportunity for opening thoughts here. It, sure. It, it's, it's, it's always wonderful being, being with y'all. And I'm glad AEI is participating in with it participating um, in this in this conversation. And I've enjoyed exploring some of these ideas um, at the University of Chicago. And so I appreciate that opportunity. And um, Winston Churchill said, Americans will always do the right thing after we've done everything else, right? Um, and I think we got a couple more things to go through before we start doing the right thing. Um, my, my dad always taught me to have a PMA, a, a positive mental attitude. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to agree with 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 some of, of Heidi's uh, comments about where we are today. Uh, unfortunately, and, and actually you've heard me say this before, the lesson of the 2020 election was don't be a jerk and don't be a socialist. Um, but unfortunately, both parties have not learned that lesson. The Republicans are trying to double down on being bigger jerks and Democrats are doubling down on trying to be bigger socialists. And, and we haven't learned that lesson. And unfortunately, um, in the House and, and Republicans in the House uh, believe that, the, that Donald Trump somehow is, is a model that we should be monitoring or, or be following. And I think that's completely wrong. Um, he lost in four years. Uh, we lost the White House, we lost the House, and we lost the Senate. And so many races around the country, uh, Republicans outperformed Donald Trump. By, by a significant margin. Uh, but, but unfortunately, the, the, the motivations um, and the incentive structure for a lot of folks doesn't exist um, to, to work and try to solve problems. In a district like I used to represent, um, I, got, I benefited from solving problems because even if every Republican voted for me, I still lost. I had to get independents. I had to get Democrats. And so I was rewarded for that kind of behavior. And in the House specifically, uh, when you have so many seats that are decided in primary, and about 92% of them um, are, are decided in the primary, you got to have people that only think about that primary voter in every, in every election. And, and people always talk about the base. You know, you got to talk to your base. Uh, the base is called America, right? And, and we should be talking to everybody. And, and my title when I was in was representative. That meant I represent everybody, even the people that didn't like me. And, and so I think we, we will eventually get to this point, but there's some structural problems, but it's gonna require some people to show some real leadership and do what's right, right? Do policy based on our values. And um, I think when we do that, I think Republicans are gonna to continue to have a greater success. Heidi, you come. Uh, you are a. Uh, you were the last standing Democrat in a state that used to elect Democrats all the time. Uh, it's now become quite a red state. But in the position you were in, you 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 like Will, there was there was an incentive to be uh, someone who reaches across the aisle, someone who tries to find common ground, and so on. You did that. Uh, both of you had high scores for bipartisanship. Um, and yet you lost. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what, what lesson did you derive from that? Not to set you up all the time to be Captain Bringdown here. Yeah, as I asked, <laughs> why are you bringing up old stuff, man? You know? <laughs> yeah, why did you lose, yeah. Heidi Heitkamp? <laughs> You're so good at what you did. Why did people reject you? Um, you know, when I ran in 2012, we had a long history of, you know, we're a Republican state, but Republicans willing to cross the aisle and vote for Democrats because they did a good job or because they demonstrated, you know, kind of an ability to get things done. And so when I won in 12, I, we expected about 20 percent of, uh, of identified or leaning Republicans would cross over and vote for me. And they did. I outperformed Barack Obama by about 22 points in North Dakota. When I ran in 18, when we talk about tribalism and this being the party of Trump, when I ran in 18, it was only 4%. And I knew that I couldn't win by saying I'm going to support this president because I hadn't for, you know, uh, at least um, two of the years that I had been in, I hadn't supported him on every move that he had made, including the tax bill, including a Supreme Court justice. And um, I thought, well, that's not what North Dakotans want. They don't want somebody who's 100% with the president. Um, my opponent, who is now in the United States Senate, we call him Senator, 
Um, he literally stood on a podium and said, I will vote with this president 100% of the time. And when you're talking to a state that is probably 54% identified uh, Republicans, never mind the leaning, it's a pretty big hurdle to get over if what they want is somebody who's going to support the president. And so North Dakota has become one of those states that is very, very much aligned with, uh, re with the uh, Republican Party. But I want to just have, give people a visual. North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and, and uh, Oklahoma and Texas, the middle of the country, literally. We used to be about 40, 60 in terms of representation, Democrats to Republicans. And it wasn't that long ago. I was the last standing Democrat in that corridor. Mm. And now you see it creeping over into, the, into um, Montana. Um, we just lost a congressional seat in Minnesota. And so that's why I think it's so important to actually begin the dialogue, not sit around and go, woe is me, look what's happening. Look at these people aren't voting the right way, but to find out what it is about the Democratic Party in particular, which is the biggest obstacle you confront if you're me running in North Dakota, what it is about the Democratic Party that people find objectionable and how can you best respond to that and offer better ideas. Yeah, and I want to, I want to, reserve the, the back end of this conversation for the what can we do uh, part of it. I, I just want to analyze where we are. Uh, first, the point you make is important. You know, in this last election, I think 95% of the voters voted for the Senate candidate who reflected their presidential choice. That was by far the highest percentage that we've seen. There are only three senators left uh, in each party in the Senate who uh, come from a state that voted for a different party for president and only one in the last election, Susan Collins. So partisanship has become tribal uh, and uh, that is one of the things that we're confronting. Will, uh, Heidi mentioned the events of the last week with uh, someone who wasn't your colleague, you left as just as she was arriving, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, and my question to you, you've been very out, you've been outspoken on what you think about her uh, comments and including uh, liking a tweet about pulling a, putting a bullet through the head of the Speaker of the House. Um, why, uh, why didn't the Republican caucus, I, I know the answer to this, but I want you to explain it. Why did the Republican caucus and the Republican leaders not on their own sanction her uh, for those comments, uh, as they did, uh, for example, Steve King from Iowa when you were there, who, who made some uh, uh, white supremacist uh, leaning comments and was stripped of his committees for it. Why didn't they act here? Well, so the so short answer is, I don't know, okay? Because uh, it's crazy to me we should have acted. And, and I remember I, I, I applauded Kevin McCarthy uh, when he took um, uh, Steve King off those uh, off those committees for his, his outlandish comments, and 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 ultimately the the what what the reason this didn't happen is people are afraid of a of a large group of voters in their districts. Um, and, and again, if, and I got to get down in the numbers. You, you talked about the Senate races in the 435 you know House races. There were only really about 34. That were from split tickets, right? So one party of president, the other party for the house. That number 20 years ago was was like an over 70, 30 wow. years ago was over 90, 40 years ago was like it was well over 125. And and so these 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 folks are worried about a small percentage of their primary voters. And and my 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 issue is this QAnon nonsense is crazy. Like everybody knows it. Like the people that you know, everybody know that the 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 election was one of the most secure elections. Why did 131 Republicans vote to not certify the election? Now, some of those, 20 of them, true believers, they actually believe the nonsense they say. Um, but the rest of them don't, and they know it's nonsense. But they go ahead. They go. They they go ahead with it um, because they're afraid. They don't want to have to defend themselves when they go back. And, and unfortunately, I think that a lot of politicians are super lazy. They don't, they're not used to having uh, tough races. You know, to me, look, every race was hard. Like every, every, every race I was in was a knife fight and a gun fight and a sword fight, you know? And so, so we had to, you know, we're used to that. 
Most people don't want to run, run, run hard races. They don't want to have to explain their votes. They don't want to have to defend where they're at. And for me, what's sad is do the right thing. You know, I, I've criticized, you know, people always say, oh, you always criticize the president. Yeah, and I agree with them sometimes. With, with also, I, did, I agree with President Obama sometimes and I disagree with him a lot of times. I'm going to agree with President Biden on some things and disagree. What's wrong with that? And why, as a country, have we started to identify one of the most important things we identify ourselves with is a political party? When did that happen? You know, I, I, Tim Alberta, who's one of the other fellows, First time we had a long conversation. I really didn't like the guy, by the way. I, I was forced into having a, doing a, a road trip with him. And he kept hounding me. He was like, when did you become a Republican? And I'm like, man, I don't, I, I, I wasn't reciting the Constitution when I was in fourth grade, okay? If that's what your answer is, it was something that I, that I came to because of my experience. And so, so, but now the fact that people draw these lines, and this is one of the, instead of necessarily identifying with their community or their neighborhood or their city, they, they start identifying with a, a political party. When did that happen? Because that wasn't the case when I was growing up. Um, and, and I think that's one of the problems. Anyway, I forget what your question was now, Axe, but um, I hope I well, answered it. Well, let me just, uh, let me refine it and say, Based on what your answer is, because I think your answer is right. I think it's it's fear of the base, and the base is responsive to, uh, still responsive to Donald Trump, uh, who has embraced uh, uh, Representative uh, uh, but, Green. Yeah, yeah go ahead. The second, the second part of that answer is they're lazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not just fear of the base. It's not wanting to go out and say look, this is what the facts were. This is why I made the decision. Let's talk about why that was important for me and why I think it reflects the values of the district. So it's not just fear. It's, it's what, what uh, Will said. It's people being lazy. I mean, yeah. you think about Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin actually led Manchin to me, which was a gun control. There's no state probably more pro-Second Amendment. When Joe did that, he went out and did town hall after town hall after town hall. And he got reelected having sponsored Manchin to me. And so, yeah. you know, he's not a lazy politician. He's somebody who will engage and enjoys yeah. engaging with the people. I think that's yeah. part of it. Yeah. But, but uh, let's let's be let's also uh, we should note that there were ten Republicans who stood up and, and voted to impeach the president of the United States after he uh, uh, after he inc helped incite a riot, uh, um, um, an insurrection at the Capitol, and you know they are now all uh, walking around with uh, bulletproof vests and security and. Um, and they are, uh, you know, life has been unpleasant for them. Not all of them. I mean, I had uh, Representative Kinzinger on my podcast earlier, uh, I guess last week. And, you know, he was, he, he said, I understood what I was getting into when I cast the vote and he wasn't complaining about it. But um, the, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, I think it's fear as well. Uh, last question for you. And then I want to ask you one question about this, Heidi. Uh, well, if that had been a, if there had been a secret ballot vote within the caucus about what to do about her, uh, how would that have come out? It would have come out probably cl close to what the, the, the vote for supporting Liz Cheney was, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you probably would have had 60 people uh, defend her, and then you would have the 140 uh, that would have been, that would have been about giving her the heave ho off, off the committees. Um, and yeah, it, yeah. Well, I mean, that tells you something right there. Heidi, uh, the, the, the Democrats in the House, uh, as we know, went ahead and they, um, and they uh, stripped her of her committee assignments. It was a highly unusual move. Usually the caucus disciplines its own members. Um, and uh, I have two questions about that. Uh, you know, I, I think there, there was, personally, I think there was cause for it given uh, all of the crazy and dangerous things that she had said, but uh, what, whatever you believe, are you at all concerned about precedent? Uh, you know, what we've seen is we've seen this sort of uh, elimination of norm after norm, uh, you know, in the Senate, you know, the whittling down of the filibuster, 
um, and also the abuse of the filibuster. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of things that were sort of the glue that held the comedy of the of these uh, institutions together have been eroded. Are you worried about that? And um, isn't part of the problem too that we weaponize these things politically? Because even as they were casting those votes, the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee was running ads in suburban districts, trying to tie uh, those members to her. And the chairman of the DCCC was quite open about, well, they're, they're gonna, they're giving away these suburban seats. And that's the impression that a lot of Americans have, which is that most of what they're focused on in Washington is securing power for one party or another. And it felt like both sides sort of displayed a little of that in this episode. You know, I, I, I remember back when uh, all the ads against Kent and Byron, two former Democratic senators here in North Dakota, where he votes with Ted Kennedy. I mean, every cycle has the, the boogeyman, right? The, the person that you don't want to be affiliated or associated with. The, what, what makes it so much more possible to weaponize is the speed at which we can communicate to various bases and the pinpointing that we can do within the social media to, to get that, drill down and actually deliver that message. Um, I think that this is bigger than, than politics though. I think that when somebody runs an ad a holding an AR-15 and says he, she wants to shoot someone through the head or Im implies that she is going to do bodily damage to Democratic members, there needs to be a response to that. And when the Republican Party failed to take the adequate measures, I think you can make an argument that it's time for the rest of the body to step up. You had 10 people who on the Republican side, you know, we're going to look at all of this, David, in, in uh, in, not in the heat of the moment, but uh, look backwards in, in about 18 months, what is the damage being done by someone like her? She has become, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has become the AOC of the, the left and they've weaponized this. And even Will uses the language of socialism. I could have a debate about him, yeah. with him about whether any that, uh, thing that the president's doing right now is socialistic. But, but the, the, the bottom line is that Every, every year we get a little more aggressive with these tactics. And at what point do you say, stop? Everybody stop, let's reevaluate. People hate government, not because they hate government, but because you tell them they should hate government. Yeah. So we have a political structure right now that is all gauged on negative and fear as opposed to visionary hope for the future. Yeah, well, you, you know, Axel, on, on that, I would say, like, has can anybody else name a former Republican conference chair, right, or the the conference chair of the Democratic Party? Like the fact that this is is national news, right, In, or, or that you have a a freshman congressman, a congresswoman. You know, it's it's just way is this crazy how like these issues are consuming, you know, um, uh, a day to day conversations. Um, but 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 it, it goes it goes back to solve a problem. The reason, the reason the country doesn't trust the government is because we're fighting over crazy things. Oh, and, and by the way, the majority does rule the house. And so if you violate that, those rules, the majority gets to move, right? And if you're not willing to police your own folks, then it's your fault, right? And, and, and that's why something should have been done. And by the way, if we want to talk about winning elections, we're giving, the we're, Republicans are giving Democrats uh, something to bludgeon us O over the head with, right? Why not start talking about, you know, wanting to work together and, and causing some of the friction within the Democratic Party of their far left and their centrist on, a, on, on kinds of legislation they, they could be able to pass. That is going to be a, a winning electoral strategy and not, you know, uh, trying to protect someone who says absolutely crazy things. Let me uh, uh, let me ask you. You've you've talked about. I, I have the quote here somewhere about the capital <laughs> insurrection, and you said uh, these people were radicalized through multiple platforms that sought to advance elected officials' ambitions for the goals of foreign adversaries. Uh, this notion of radicalization uh, is something that we haven't really talked about in American politics. We mm -hmm. we thought about it in another context when you were working for the CIA. 
There were concerns about radicalization of Americans by uh, malign forces uh, overseas and activated against Americans. But um, the, the talk about radicalization within our mm. own politics, because it doesn't just extend to uh, people in the capital who are in the capital that day, obviously. It's, it's bigger than that and a bigger concern. Absolutely. It's a bigger concern and it's been going on for a long time. Right. The 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 insurrection of the Capitol on January 6 was the was the culmination of years of of misinformation, disinformation and radicalization. And it's something that, um, you know, and, 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 and we we let it happen when you don't when you don't stand up and say something is wrong or you let or you 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 continue to add to it, you let you increase its volume. And, and why was, and, and if we take radicalization and, and Islamic extremism, why was ISIS uh, had the ability to radicalize folks in the United States of America, even when they were 6,000 miles away? They had the tools that those tools were, be, were able to be amplified. We're seeing that here. A, another, another member of our, of our fellow cohort, cohort um, Kara Swisher, she's participated in a, in a documentary called After Truth, um, and it's about disinformation. And, and one of the things that's fascinating in this movie is they talk about Pizzagate and they talk about the guy that went into the, the pizza shop and literally thought, he truly believed that there was a basement and kids were being taken advantage of. Mm. And, and he came to the realization he had been lied to, right? And, and, and how, how, how are people believing this? How are people that are educated, yeah, for, right? For, for, just for a second, for those of you who don't know the background on this, uh, this was, I think, at sort of the beginnings of QAnon, but this mm -hmm. notion that Hillary Clinton was part of a, a global pedophilia ring and that they were hiding uh, ch captive uh, children in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. It sounds insane, but, uh, you know, there were like a couple of million people who circulated this, uh, circulated this story, and it, it did activate this one person, but it has... Doesn't it also have, and, and Heidi, I'll bring you in, um, you know, social media, uh, the siloing of media, the uh, echoing of uh, false stories uh, by media outlets and social media. That has a broader impact than just sort of the people who go out and act on them in violent ways. But we're, we're having two different sets of conversations in this country. Uh, it, it, the, the challenge is enormous. Uh, on, on extremism, I want to remind everybody that Janet Napolitano, when she was the head of Homeland Security in the first term, actually issued a, a statement saying one of the most serious threats in America was the radicalization of um, law enforcement and the military and uh, the, um, the growth of white supremacist groups. So this is not, everybody can sit around and say it's about Donald Trump, but he was new to the scene when this started. And so you, 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 the, what Donald Trump did is he invited people to the table. He said, yes, I think, I think you, there's something there. I think, I think, I think I'm, I, you're, you're my guy or you're my people. And so the Republican party became a party that needed to pander to white supremacist groups and pander to the absolute crazy conspiracy groups. And that's how he built his majority. That's how he basically built his power. That's why he couldn't get rid of them. I mean, that's why he said on the day of the insurrection, he went to camera and said, I love you. I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling what happened. But I think now, how do we walk this back? How do we do the hard work that it's gonna take to kind of get facts and information out there when you have lazy politicians who would rather just, you know, reflect what's happening in their district or what, what their, their so-called base believes as opposed to lead people towards a better result in government. And that, you know, that, that's one of the real challenges that we have today is how do we walk all of this back? Because now they've been at the table and they don't wanna give up that power. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I, I've said this a million times. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but the reason why Profiles and Courage was a slim volume. 
You know, politicians <laughs> generally follow the market. They generally follow the market. They want to get reelected. They want to retain power. Um, you know, it takes extraordinary leaders to uh, break, to show courage and break away. And we've seen, ex uh, you know, we've seen examples of it uh, recently of people uh, of people doing that, but you've raised the question, Heidi. Now, wh uh, what is the answer? And I guess I want to give you, because we're going to get to questions. I want to give you each, and Will, you hinted at this before you both did, talk about what you think you on your side of the aisle have to do. Speak to Democrats, Heidi, and then I want, Will, I want you to speak to Republicans. Um, first off, and um, this week, or I think it was last week, John Kerry, when asked what oil field workers would do as we're seeing this transition to green economy, said they should build solar panels. And um, that's, that's like, like a, a siren song for insult um, among oil field workers. And so we need to sit down and talk to working people again, Democrats, and not assume we know what they need. We need to figure out how we can talk to the middle of the country who may not share our social values to try and find some common ground for moving forward. You know, it's interesting, uh, David, I, I, I met a young man, I just fascinated. He went door to door in Iowa and he has more stories and probably is better equipped to answer that question. But he said he was trained not to ask, what do you want? He was trained to ask, what kind of America do you want to live in? And that's where he found unity. He said it really didn't matter. Their political bent, they all kind of answered that question the same. And so we need to get back to a political dialogue that says, what kind of America are we going to be and how do we deliver it, whether it's delivered by a Democrat or by a Republican? But you can't do that if you're not knocking a door and actually asking and respecting the answer that you get. And I think Democrats have, right or wrong, have a reputation for disrespecting people when I started out in politics, my base were elderly and working people. That's exactly who's not voting for Democrats today. Yeah, you know, uh, we, I should say, just to augment your point, uh, we have this Bridging the, the, the Divide program at the Institute of Politics. We just had our, our first uh, day of this 2021 session today. We bring students together from Eureka College downstate, from Arupe College in Chicago and the University of Chicago. And one of the things we do is we do focus groups in both places so they can hear how voters speak. And the Chicago group was this morning. And when they were asked, well, why do so many people in downstate Illinois support uh, Donald Trump? Um, you know, the answers were uh, racism, white supremacy, they're ignorant, they're uh, vulnerable, they're small, they're attention seekers. Um, and they're poor. There was no, there was no, um, there was no offsetting kind of. Yeah, I kind of get why that could happen. Or, and I, and I, I just want to say to be fair, I know from experience because we do this every year that when we get down to uh, Central Illinois and we have our focus group there, we're going to hear a lot of a lot of ugly caricatures uh, that are headed back the other way. And so this kind of um, personal. Uh, sort of caricaturing of people um, as part of this political storytelling that has been weaponized has also driven us apart, but part of it is attitudinal. And, uh, you know, uh, Biden said in his inauguration speech, we've got to learn to, to, to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Uh, that, and that is not just a cliche, that is a necessity. There has to be a willingness to... Uh, to listen. Well, uh, what, uh, if you, I could you, just you say, it's, about... it, it, it's the fundamental of every religion in America. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even, and it, and maybe even beyond America. Uh, Will, uh, uh, you, you had a mess. You, you, were, you were talking before about what you think the Republican Party needs to do. I think there is a prevailing view among uh, people who are not in your wing of the Republican Party that you know, uh, that if the Republican Party can just dominate those areas of the country where that are demographically friendly, uh, you know, the, the upper Midwest, uh, parts of the South, uh, you know, th that they can put together with, you know, Texas, with Florida. Now you can speak to Texas, that, that they, you can, they can maintain, you know, 
uh, some foothold or some power. Parties lost the popular vote in the country seven out of the last eight elections and the demographics are changing. So what, what, what is the proper uh, direction for the Republican party in the context of what we're talking about here, sure. uh, about a, a greater sense of uh, fellowship and comedy and uh, ident identification with each other instead of division? Look, if, if you wanna keep the Republican party narrow that's going to only be successful for a short period of time, right? Because of the demographics. And we have an opportunity. Uh, the fact that Donald Trump lost as, as large, uh, by as large a margin as he did, yet Speaker Pelosi didn't pick up any seats um, is, is a sign that there's an opportunity for us. And it, and it starts with some very basic things. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a misogynist. Uh, don't be racist. Uh, don't be a homophobe, right? Like some of those very, very simple things. Uh, but also we take a message to somebody, right? I, I'm a black Republican that represented a 71% Latino district that nobody thought that I should have won or ever was going to get reelected. And how'd I do it? Because I don't care what community you come from, you care about three things. You want to put food on your table, a roof over your head, and make sure the people you love are, are healthy and happy. So talk about those issues, right? Be a party that's actually based on values and, and explain those values and translate that into, into policy. There was an old saying back in the day that good policy is good politics. Um, right? we, we don't do that anymore. And, and, and I think part of the problem is you need elected officials that stop talking to the professional political class or the political industrial cartel, sorry, sorry, Axe, um, that are that drive some of these narratives, right? Yeah. It's 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 like, you know, you have these you have these political consultants that want to run the same election in 20 different different places and have the same message. And and guess what? Primaries, a lot of many people vote in primaries. The average across the country is about 42,000 people, right? Um, in some, it's even as low as 25,000. And then when you look at the people that actually vote in general election, that delta is pretty significant. So, so stop being lazy and talk to a, water, a, a broader swath of people. And if we do it based on our values, we have a chance to win. Imagine if Republicans were seen in this 2020 election as taking COVID seriously. Imagine what our victories would have looked like then. We would have, we would have picked up more seats. And, and so we, we actually, despite all the craziness, despite this, 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 these, these far right nuts in the party, we still have an opportunity to pick up seats, but that's gonna cause us to change, change our narrative, narrative. And at the end of the day, these are the things that we, taught, we were taught as a kid, right? Treat people with respect. Love thy neighbor like thyself, right? Be honest. If you can't say yeah. something nice, don't say anything at all. If we remember all of our kindergarten teachings, um, we, we, we would probably be a lot more successful. That is uh, probably good advice for both parties, to be honest with you. Uh, but um, uh, let, let me just say, uh, be, uh, we're going to go to questions, so I'm not going to ask you for comments on this. Um, we should not let ourselves as voters and citizens off the hook. Uh, you know, there's a lot of blame for politicians and, and justifiably so, but it's also true that we have responsibilities, responsibilities to not to believe everything that we hear, responsibilities to try and put ourselves in other people's issues, you know, uh, resp yeah, responsibilities to stand up for people who are willing to be reasonable, who are willing to reach across party lines. You know, a lot of the reason that we have the situation we have is because party primaries are dominated by, um, by uh, you know, base core, core base voters. Uh, and uh, a lot of people who say they want uh, something else don't participate in in uh, in primaries, and then you know there's this paradox in polling where people say, "I really want the politicians in Washington to get along, and I want them to compromise." But then when you dig in, they just don't want them to compromise on the things that they don't want them to compromise on. So, you know, they want compromise as long as they don't compromise on anything I care about, uh, and that. You know, so there's some responsibility for for voters at, as well. So let's let's go to let's go to uh, questions, and we're going to start with uh, Ava, who is a high school student, and her question is for Senator Heitkamp. 
Yeah, Ava, I think you're on mute. Hi, um, my name is Ava, and um, like Mr. Axelrod said, um, this is directed at Senator Heidkamp specifically, um, though of course open to anyone. Um, at the very beginning of this session, you stated that the GOP is still the party of Trump, and you expressed pessimism regarding the current state of political discourse. Um, do you believe that another party will splinter off of the GOP, either pro or anti-Trump, or do you foresee the GOP sticking together as a party behind one of those factions? Thank you. I, you know, there's a lot of people who think that there's going to be a new middle of the road party. And I think if they thought they could entice somebody like me to join them, I think they would feel, you know, some, some uh, more conservative Democrats and form a center a center um, right or center left party. Um, I think it's really, really hard to think about winning electoral races by splintering the current party. And so even though you've got the Republicans against Trump, um, you've got the Lincoln Project, you've got all these groups that were very engaged against Trump and now they're engaged against um, uh, uh, you know, people who are complicit in things like Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't really see an effective third party movement yet in this country. And so um, I think that the Republican Party is going to have to sort it out. And if they don't sort it out, we're going to see the Democratic Party actually recruiting, um, again, more uh, white um, uh, college educated suburbanites uh, and business people to our party as opposed to, um, to a third party. Uh, let me quickly ask you guys, do you think that uh, Biden's tone will, uh, will, will be helpful? Uh, I noticed today, you know, he's moving forward on budget reconciliation, which Will would call socialism and Heidi would call so, uh, something else. Significantly important. <laughs> yeah. but, but in, in any case, he was asked about those who people, uh, Republicans who he met with and who he's been speaking with. And he said, there are some really fine people who want to get something done, but they're just not willing to go as far as I think we have to go. Um, and I thought it was interesting because what he was saying is we don't agree on this, but that doesn't mean they're bad people or that they don't mm -hmm. want to do something positive. And um, I'm just wondering how I, that struck me as a very good note to strike. Uh, do uh, you know, I guess I should ask Will because he'd probably be on the other side of this reconciliation issue. budget. Reg do you think that that tone will matter? I think tone definitely matters. I, I think I think uh, President Biden is trying to set the right tone, and I think his biggest problem is is, is not his tone. It's going to be Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer's in a, in unwillingness and and not wanting to work with Republicans. I think the fact that President Biden sat down with ten Republicans, he's even said you know prior to today. Uh, that, you know, I put forward my plan and I recognize my plan may not be the thing that gets put into law. Um, and, and I think a, a willingness to negotiate and President Biden, if he really wants to get some things done in, in a bipartisan way, is probably going to have to jump over Democratic leadership in both the House and the Senate and try to work directly with with Republicans that are willing to, to play ball. And we saw those 10 in the Senate and we there's probably any at any on any particular issue, 20 or 30 in the House. Uh, but I don't know if the electoral potential electoral pushback for something like that is what's going to ultimately happen. And, and to yeah, Ava's yeah, question, David, you're not yeah. going to you're not going to have a, a Republican Party splinter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to just um, because because I do not believe that Donald Trump was responsible for what happened in Georgia. I believe what was responsible for what happened in Georgia is two millionaires, billionaires in some case. Um, being unwilling to provide uh, COVID relief when people need it at the mm. most. And that got hammered and hammered. It's going to be very, very, a very tough vote. Like the tax vote was a tough vote for me. It's going to be a very tough vote for people to walk away from a $14, $100 check when they're sitting in mansions, when, they, when, when we have the most millionaires uh, sitting in Congress as we ever had and saying no to ordinary people. And I think Joe Biden understands that. So yes, there's tone, but he also understands that he's got, he's got an inside straight here that um, I think uh, he can play to, to get bipartisan support. And, and, and Axe, this $1.9 billion thing, somebody else suggested a $1.9 billion uh, uh, COVID package, and that was Donald Trump. And, yeah. and so, so, so and, and you know, you're putting words in my mouth. I let it go a few times. I may have already voted on a $1.9 billion package. So, 
Um, like I said, reconciliation is a tool. Uh, Republicans should have passed the budget when we could so that, so that President Biden doesn't get two bites of the apple. He gets two reconciliations, right? He's going to use one for, for this. And, and that, was a, that, was a bad, that was a bad move on, on Republican leadership. I know we're getting in the weeds and electoral yeah, we strategies. We but, are, and you know. we, got, we got to get to these questions. And, mm -hmm. and we have Justin from the University of Alabama, who's probably still uh, celebrating a national championship down there. But uh, uh, Justin, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Justin. Uh, I'm from the University of Nebraska. I think that's... Did you want the Which Justin? one's Alabama? Alabama. We, want the, Alabama. we want the Alabama one. No, right. we want Nebraska. We want <laughs> Nebraska. We're going we're gonna to take Alabama first. Right. And then yeah. We're going to take Nebraska. Yeah, I am still celebrating our national championship. I'm sorry about <laughs> your Aggies, uh, Congressman Hurd. Y'all were, were close, but... We were robbed. We were robbed. That's what we should be talking about. You know? <laughs> Stop um, the steal. Stop the steal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyways, thank you all for coming here uh, and talking to us today. I'm the council president of the AEI Executive Council at the University of Alabama, uh, Roll Tide. Uh, I have a question for Representative Hurd, but uh, Senator Heitkamp, you might have a different perspective on it. Um, Representative Hurd, your district, after you announced your retirement, was written off for Republicans as like a safe Democratic seat, and then it ended up being won by uh, a Republican pretty handily. Uh, what do you think led to that? And also, like, what do you think led to the GOP increase in uh, minority voters? As uh, someone who's like in your wing of the Republican Party myself, ideologically, sure. it surprised me how that happened, especially with someone like Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. Sure, there, there was three things that were involved. Um, the reason it was tight in 2018 was because of a guy whose name rhymes with Beto O'Rourke. Um, the he his turnout. Um, really, you know, in the 23rd was something that I had to overcome. Uh, my opponent at the time thought he was, he hurt her, but he actually helped her. That's, that's one piece. Second, the, the other two issues is defund the police and the, the aggression against um, the, the oil and gas industry. Uh, along the border, about 40% uh, plus or minus a few of Latinos are connected to law enforcement. And it's like another 40% is connected in some form or fashion to the energy sector. And so when you have a narrative that, um, that those two industries are gonna potentially be impacted, uh, you're gonna see uh, people go vote uh, to make sure that they protect their ability to put food on the table. And so those were, those, were, those were some factors that were unique and in play in 2020 that a lot of folks didn't talk about. Oh, and by the way, uh, we, made, we made it easier for people to pull a lever for a Republican and you know, the, the sky didn't open up and they didn't get struck by, down by a lightning bolt, right? So uh, they had a few, they had a few, some few examples of, of being okay and being proud of that vote. Uh, if, if I can just add to it, the Democratic Party is incredibly unsophisticated as it relates to Hispanic voters. They think all you have to do is say kids at the border isn't this terrible. Um, what's what's happened and that that everybody's going to fall in line and they're going to get 90 percent. Uh, you know, they, they really need to understand the economic issues that Will just outlined that in, in every location in the country, um, the economic issues for Hispanic voters are different. And you're going to see these results. Yeah. And by the way, you got to actually get out and campaign. You can't sit. You can't chill in your house, you know, and, and do this by Zoom. And that's another thing they learned that Democrats learned in Georgia. Uh, is that, you know, Stacey Abrams said, guys, y'all got to go knock on some doors this time in, the, in this next month and a half, rather than just texting everybody. And, and so that was, that was another, that was another factor. Lazy politicians are taking a beating here. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> Thank y'all. Uh, uh, Han, can you uh, step up? Yep. Uh, uh, Senator Heidkamp, uh, Representative Hurd, Mr. Axelrod, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Ahan. I'm a first year at the college um, in the University of Chicago. And so my question is, Representative Hurd touched on the polarizing effect of primaries where candidates are incentivized to push more radical in their policies and their rhetoric to distinguish themselves from their base. Uh, in the 2020 Democratic primary, candidates like Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard managed to garner significant crossover support from Republicans, but the primary process essentially doomed their chances. So how can the primary process on like either in the case of either party um, be changed to actually incentivize cross-party cooperation? Look, you got it. campaigns are real simple. ID your voters, turn them out. 
Okay. And, and, and so, so that is the responsibility of the campaign and the organization in order to do that. And, and so, you know, if, if you can't get a, if you can't get someone, you know, in, in, a, in an open, a closed primary, if, if your message is not powerful enough to get that person to be like, Hey, I'm going to do something different. Right. Then your message isn't powerful, more, isn't powerful enough. In Texas, we have open primaries. And, and so the, the, you, you got to ID those voters and, and turn them out. And, and, and guess what? Social media and cable news is not the only indicator of somebody's success. And so I think, I think in this day and age, it's, it's the one thing we can monitor and we use that as a show of strength, but it doesn't always translate into, into electoral success. And, and so, I, you know, structurally, yeah, I, I would, I, if I had a magic wand, the way I would fix things is to make all districts competitive. You can do this on the House, Senate is different because it's the entire state, but make all seats, you know, plus or minus six in, in any, in any uh, plus six R, plus six D, you know, no more than that, because that basically makes it a jump ball. Yeah. That would require state legislatures to, uh, to act in ways that they may not feel is in their self. Uh, no, they're not going to do it. Uh, you know, Democrats that are in power don't want to change it, and Republicans that are in power don't want to change it. So that's why I said it was a magic wand. Um, be, be, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think there's that, there's just one phenomenon though here is is that primaries like California, where everybody's in the primary, and then you take the top two. That may be a, a reform that you want to look at if you're looking at, um, mm -hmm. but otherwise, uh, people who are identified as Democrats are going to pick their Democratic candidate. Um, there's more to be said about this, but I want to move on because I, I, I cheated the uh, second Justin out of his turn there. So <laughs> I want to get him back. Justin. Justin from Nebraska, where are you? The Cornhusker. That's right. We, we have just a few fewer national championships than the Alabama folks, but they're, they're a little more, a little more distant history. Uh, I'll ask my question really quick. Uh, thank you. I, my name is Justin. I'm a, a senior studying economics um, and I'm associated with AEI's executive council. Uh, my question is basically, uh, I was disappointed with the Republican party before the past two months. Um, and now I've, I'm despairing over what to do. Some sm smart folks I respect have given up like Justin Amash uh, joined the Libertarian Party. And so specifically my question for um, for Representative Hurd is just, what would you advise the young folks who don't like the direction of the Republican Party? Um, what would you advise us to do? Um, should we stay in the party? Should we leave the party? Um, and what are your thoughts about how we kind of move forward from here? Thank you. Uh, one, thanks for the question and thanks for being honest, right? And and shame on all those uh, that have let you down. And my, my point is stay in the party and help perform it. Right. You know, these these are not. Um, yes, Donald Trump was the titular head and he still probably has the greatest influence in the party uh, right now. But he's not the only one. And if we don't stay and fight and try to reform it, then it's going to have, a, have a, it's going to be a problem for the country. Everybody should care about having two strong parties because the, 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 the problem we have, we are facing a generational defining struggle with the, the, the government of China, uh, this, 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 this new Cold War and a race on who is going to uh, achieve um, global supremacy and advanced technology is gonna define our economy, it's gonna define the global economy. We are in this war right now. And the only way we're gonna solve this problem is if we actually talk about these issues in, in a bipartisan way and try to solve problems together. And, and so we need a strong Republican party, we need a strong Democratic party, and we need young folks like you and your friends that are willing to, to dig in. So do some things. The people that you actually believe in, continue to support them. Reward them, help them out, right? There are some good folks that are that are still toiling away. Peter Meyer in Michigan, who replaced it, your boy Justin Amash, right? Now, Just, Justin, Justin's a friend of mine. I don't know, it, you know, I think he's always been a libertarian, right? I just think he finally, he just finally confirmed that. Um, and and so so you got Justin Amash. Uh, you, you have Adam Kinzinger who's sitting there battling out. My my homegirl Liz Cheney. Um, so there, there's a lot of us that are trying to that are trying to to reform the party and help those people out because we need we need people like you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, the last question will be from Juliana Rossi, who's a third year student at the University of Chicago. 
Hi, um, I'm Juliana. I'm a third year and I'm currently in Los Angeles. So one thing that we've heard a lot about is people talking about the empathy gap between the parties. So what do you say to Americans who don't actually know how to talk to each other on big issues that need to be solved, like COVID? And how do we engage with those people to get a better result in our government, even if we do find some of those views objectionable? Senator? I, I think the first thing is you don't lead with politics. I mean, you find out who's your grandma? How's your grandma doing? Is she having some trouble? You know, you, you do what Joe Biden does. I mean, Joe Biden does this very, very well. I have seen him work rope lines. I have seen him, you know, walk across, even people protesting, wanting to know who they are and what, what their family struggles are. And so you've got to lead with where people are and then talk about politics. But the mistake people make is, you need to listen to me. I, I've got all the answers and you're, you're voting against your interests. Well, you know, they don't think that. They think they're casting a vote in a way that makes sense to them. And, and so to me, um, you got you to gotta get to know people, get to know people where they are, and then you can form the kinds of alliances and discussions that lead to a more unified American identity. I love the phrase empathy gap, uh, Juliana. Thanks for that. I'm going to start using it. Um, and it, look, seek to understand before being understood, right? And, and I think that's uh, what, what my friend Senator Heidkamp is, is saying, and, and that's what we need to do. It also starts with a recognition that the other person you're probably talking to cares about the country and wants to see problems solved as much as you do, right? And so if we can accept that, and then we can also recognize we don't always have to agree. And I always ask people, I'm like, do you agree 100% with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend? And like, they're like, of course not. I was like, so what, how much do you agree on, right? Why are we trying to expect more uh, from our elected officials than what we do in our own in individual lives? But uh, those things that we learned in kindergarten, as I said before, treat people with respect. And if we actually try to love our neighbor like ourselves, uh, we're, we'll go a long way. And it sounds Pollyanna-ish, uh, but, but, but actually trying to live that is, is hard. And it starts with each one of us uh, making that decision and doing that in our own life. Because if we can be an example to somebody else, then maybe that catches on and grows. Let me say that both of you are great examples and models for that kind of politic. And um, it's a pleasure to be around you. It's a pleasure to hear from you. And it's a pleasure to know that you're not giving up, that you're fighting the good fight and trying to model a better kind of politics uh, for your parties and for the country. Uh, so that, that's something that gives me hope, along with all these young people who uh, who've joined us this morning, who will have a, a greater say than anybody, uh, a, any of us, uh, about what the future of this country looks like. So thank you to you guys for this, for your time here at the University of Chicago. We love having you. And to all of you who have joined us today. Thanks, David.